Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today, uh, what I want to talk about are two sort of hidden gems. If you look, you can find some really great buys with these two brands. Uh, one of them, and, and they're both without their watchmaker now. I mean, they, when in the early 2000s uh, and in the 90s, uh, both Daniel Roth and uh, Roger Dubuis had, that was their starting point. Then they got into their own uh, named watch brand and then a number of things happened. So let's take a look at them. And the, the ones I'm only going to focus on are the ones that I think you can find a good buy with these days. Now, in order to understand Daniel Roth, you, you have to start back in the, I think it was in the 70s, 1975, when the Chaumet brothers purchased Breguet. And Breguet was holding on by a threat at that time. And so they, they, they brought in Daniel Roth to sort of bring it back alive again. And a number of things that he did, for example, he put the a coin edge. These were all brigades that he worked on. Uh, and here's one example of one of the watches that he did, uh, the 3330. Uh, the Clota Paris Guiloche, which is a like a hobnailed uh, kind of a Guiloche. Uh, what's called the Burin engraved Roman numerals. Uh, Breguet hands. Now these, it may not seem like a big deal, but what Breguet had become by that time wasn't anything at all uh, imagined, I doubt, by Abraham Louis Breguet. And so, in a, in, to me, in a very real sense, uh, Breguet came in, uh, was saved by Daniel Roth. Now, Strange thing happened. The uh, Chaumet brothers went broke, and uh, so that was a a problem. And at that point, I think let me see, let me check the date on that. Um, he was with Brigade from seventy five to eighty eight, and then from nineteen eighty eight until nineteen eighty uh, nineteen ninety four. This was the autonomous period for uh, Daniel Roth. Now, some of the things that he had during this period, uh, first of all, he had these double edge, uh, double eclipse, ellipse, blah, 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 double ellipse cases uh, in 18 karat gold. They, everything was in 18 karat gold or platinum. And the some of the things they had, they had arrow hands, uh, they had the flat, uh, glass uh, on the sapphire, and they had straight lugs. Now, this is uh, this particular one is a uh, Metropolitan 24 Cities, and this came later. What happened was that um, at some point. Daniel Roth was bought, let me see, I think it's uh, right around uh, 1994. Daniel Roth was uh, was transferred as a share somehow. I'm not sure what was going on. They were transferred to the Hourglass, which is a Singapore uh, watch company. And um, then in 2000, so from 1994, to 2000, the Hourglass owned them, and they had their own ideas. And what they had was something similar, but also different. Uh, this one is probably from that period, and I have another one uh, also from that period. This is a chronograph, and uh, like I said, this is the 24 cities. Uh, what they've retained is that they retain the double ellipse, uh, they retain the arrow hands, and uh, the the very flat, uh, there's no uh, dome at all in the uh, in the glass on these, and so it's it's what the hourglass wanted to do. They wanted to make them more available. 
Roth had all of these gold watches and platinum and so forth, and they were uh, they just weren't selling the way that Hourglass would like to see them sell. Well, to make a long story short, thing. Let me check the date. Two thousand. Hourglass <laughs> filed for bankruptcy, and so uh, at that point, Roth ended up with uh, Bulgari. And Bulgari wanted all of uh, Ross's shares, and it was pretty much the end of anything autonomous that was being done by Daniel Roth. And so what happened, uh, he worked with Bulgari for a very unhappy year, as, my, as I understand it. There were some watches that came out that were very interesting during that period. Uh, and they reflected, I think, a lot of the older ones that he uh, that he worked on uh, earlier in, in his work. And so there's some of those if you're, I mean, if you to, to find a Daniel Roth. But the ones, I think, that are the real hidden gems and the best buy are the ones, and again, what you can afford, uh, are the ones from sort of the hourglass period where they were, where they were making them a lot less expensive. Now, to some extent, uh, a lot of people think that ruined them. And if you think the same thing, then, then don't don't worry about it. I, I I found a lot of different elements in it. And my experience has been very good with both of these watches as far as timekeepers. One of the things that uh, Roth had done, he had uh, during his autonomous period, he had only used uh, top watchmakers, uh, not top watchmakers, but top uh, movements. One by Frederick, uh, one by Frederick Piguet, Lamania, and Jajar Lacoutre. So, if you find some of the older ones, are the ones from between uh, 1988 and 1994. Those are where you're going to find some very expensive ones. Uh, but also very nice ones. On the other hand, if you're not rich, <laughs> but you'd like something, buy a, one of the most, you know, world-class um, watchmakers. Uh, you can get a Daniel Roth with something like this that made out of steel. Now, the the next one that I call a hidden gem, this is Roger Dubuis. Roger Dubuis, um was... <sighs> There's a, there's a lot about Roger Dubuis and in terms of his relationship with his partner, who was basically a business partner, but also sort of fancied himself as somewhat artistic, I guess. Uh, and so the movements by Roger Dubuis are, are really fantastic. I, I have two watches with what's called an RD-14. Uh, this is my Easy Diver. Uh, the Easy Diver sort of it came out of a generation of what started as sports activity watches, like uh, this, the rectangular one showing. Now, a lot of people just like, they didn't like that at all. But the thing about them, they had the Geneva seal. Uh, this one has the Geneva seal. It's got the gold rotor also. Here's another one that I have. Uh, this one also has the RD-14. It's got no second hand, and it's just a straight-up wine. This is a true diver with a lockdown uh, uh, crown, and, you know, it's, 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 it's really a great, great watch. And these can be affordable. Uh, what the problem is, is their prices have been creeping up. Uh, there's some other watches, like the... Um, Monegas La Moganes. They would have to have a hard one for me. Uh, on the right there, and this is, to me, it's a very attractive watch. Uh, very simple, very clean. I like that one a lot, too. Again, with the uh, uh, Roger Dubuis movement. Now, there are other ones that are in the stratosphere in terms of price. The Sympathy Perpetual Calendar is one. Another one, and it's very hard to find, is a Roger Dubuis uh, 3 Retrograde. 
there are a lot of, this guy was extremely creative, did a lot of different uh, watches and a lot, and uh, just you know, <laughs> some fantastic uh, things that he did. But what it is, the, the way to hide, to really find the hidden gem is that you have to sort of have the parameters of where to look. And I think if you go digging around in the Roger Dubuis and the Daniel Roth watches, you're going to find something that I think is a really good buy. Unfortunately, what happened during the pandemic, and there weren't any other watches available, collectors started, you know, on their own, started looking and they discovered these and they bought up a lot of them. Because the ones that I bought before the pandemic were okay great buys and now they, they gone up but i notice they're starting to settle back down again because people want to go out and get the usual suspects let me know what you think this is an opportunity to subscribe if you like and until next time this is bill sanders for watch art side the art and science of watch Talks. and by the way this is my horological society of new york pen great organization to become involved with take care see you next time